it was inevitable that eventually I got around to covering this game, The Return of the Stainless Steel Rat. It was an Aries magazine game from Aries number 10, and like some of the other Aries games I covered, most notably The Voyage of the BSM Pandora, which if you watch my channel you know is one of my all-time favorite games, this is also a paragraph-based game, a solo design game, and um, it has a paragraph system, which we'll talk about a little bit, and it is based on this existing character, the Stainless Steel Rat, created by Harry Harrison. And indeed, in the Ares magazine, there is a story that is, in effect, the game that you are then playing out. Now, in the story in the magazine, um, the game plays out, or I should say the story plays out in a particular way, but the setup is the same, which is that you are on a ship that has been taken over by a... Um, corrupt computer, a sort of um, off-the-rails computer, and in the end there is a person behind this who is the one controlling it and having motives of their own for causing the computer to take over. So in the story it's one particular character and you are then playing the game out to determine which character it is in the context of the game. So the game itself is a combination of um, almost like I don't want to say clue, but um, those types of stories where you are trying to figure out from among a set pool of potential villains who it actually is, and it is going to be one of the cast of characters that are in the game, and we can see looking here in the rules, it is referred to as the cast of characters, and you have your main character, who is the stainless steel rat. Now, you have the option, if you want, of playing his wife, and here she is on my tactical display because I was playing her. Um, she's not in the actual short story itself, but there is the option of playing her in the game. And and then there are some other characters here in the who are in this ship. Um, well, again, you have his wife here. You have a commander, a deputy commander, a um, assistant science officer, and a waitress. You've got a businessman who's trapped there, and you also have the um, the guy who does kind of the day to day maintenance on the ship. So these are like an, in effect NPCs in the game, and they have their own counters, and you can encounter them during the course of your game, and. Part of the game mechanic is to determine who among them is the villain. So at the begin and by villain here, this means the person who has is behind taking control over this computer and causing it to um, wreak havoc on everybody. There are uh, villain shits in the game, and these are pictured here. Let me see if I can pull one out for you. At the beginning of the game, you randomly choose a set of uh, six villain shits, they all have letters here, and so each letter, here's from set F, is six uh, that are numbered F, and then on the flip side, they have numbers one through six, and then they have paragraph numbers down the sides. Sorry for the darkness here a little bit. We got some stormy weather coming in. When relevant to you during the course of the game, you're instructed to pull one of these out from among the six you have selected prior to play and roll a d6 and based on what you get, you refer to a paragraph number and then you will determine whether or not you are getting some type of clue in that paragraph as to the identity of the villain. Well, I should say all of the paragraphs that are referred to on these counters do provide some clues. It is up to you as you go through the game to keep track of the clues that you get to, at the end of the game, meet the victory conditions, or at least one of the victory conditions for winning the game which is to determine successfully who has taken control over this computer. Now, the computer here is depicted by this skull area. These aren't hexes, this is an area. And we'll take a look here, just pulling back for a moment at the map of the game. We have here the large section of the ship which is divided into rings and um, they are different levels, A being the lowest level up through C. And the terrain as it is, is really color-coded markings for different types of um, rooms. So you have access ways, 
accommodations, corridors, industrial areas, service areas, and then within that you have various indications of doors and bulkheads and where you can enter and things like that. The access ways allow you to travel from level to level. Well, there are some other ways of traveling from level to level, but in effect what you are doing during the course of the game is exploring this ship as playing the character of Harry or his wife and you are playing um, you are exploring the ship to both get to the computer dis disarm or disable the computer as well as discover who is behind the um, taking over of the computer so both of those things are necessary to win the game the uh, conceit of the game in terms of the currency in a sense of the game is what they're calling uh, the suspension of disbelief track. So during the course of the game you if you exceed a maximum of 75 on this track you automatically lose the game. You gain these points, the suspension of disbelief points in a number of different ways. The first of them is when you choose to outfit your character. You have at the beginning of the game various options for equipment that you can use to help you and um, you know this is a kind of campy sort of game so you could get for example a golf club or I took a bottle of scotch which is somewhere here and for each of the things that you take on the left hand side there is a value that is the suspension of disbelief value this is what it costs you in the suspension of disbelief to carry this item so you need to tally that up at the beginning of the game and that sets you on your way toward getting to that number of 75 so you're playing against that you can also accrue uh, more suspension of disbelief points by, for example, killing characters in the game. So if you just ran through the um, spaceship killing everybody you saw, everyone you saw, you get five points of disbelief, you would eventually just lose the game that way. So there is a way that it is built in to try to stop you from doing that. The other values on the counters that we see are I'll show you here in the rules. I think it might be a little clearer to see. You do have a counter for your main character and you're given an alertness value to start. This can change. Um, you can lose alertness for various reasons and this comes into play when you determine initiative for combat and we'll talk about that a little bit. You have an innate combat strength and then the uh, weapons that you choose also may have combat strength. So for example, this gun has a combat strength of 7. And again, on the left is the um, cost, the suspension of disbelief cost. And the middle number here is the fire combat value. And that refers to the weapons table, which is basically how you are determining the outcome of firing a weapon. So it's a, basically there's two CRTs in effect. There's a hand-to-hand -hand combat effects table and a weapons table and you can see it's not terribly complicated because what you do simply is refer to the weapon that you are using and you then roll 2d6 uh, d is here to see what you get and the values are you could stun someone or kill someone and there's a couple of other effects and modifiers. Additionally, the villains that you will encounter in the course of the game, which could be robots or those NPCs that I talked about, some of them will be having weapons, combats, values on them, and they will have some unspecified, in certain cases, weapons that come with a letter, and you refer to that letter when using this table when they are attacking you. It's worth giving you a closer look at some of the counters now that I've got some better light. So, for example, here is a bartender that you might encounter in the game. And all these robots are, well, most of them are rogue elements in the game. You can win them over to your side, but you can see the same values that I mentioned on the counters there. And you have the other side, the people characters. So here is um, somebody who is existing on the ship when Harry comes to investigate and help them out of their troubles. And then I mentioned this scotch bottle but didn't really show it to you. You have in this game scotch is a good thing. It gives you an increased 
um, a combat effect, uh, oddly. And there are things that you would more expect. Well, here's another sort of campy little element. There's a humidor. You can be smoking a cigar, and <laughs> magically the cigar smoke can help you to um, cause... Uh, confusion to your enemy and that's going to help you in combat. Then there are some things that are more standard like this first aid kit and they're double-sided and they're not all the same so you are limited a bit um, if you take this first aid kit. There's more than one of these but um, then you can't take this flashlight as well. And um, they also have the capacity, some of the weapons that you have, this laser pistol for example, can jam. So you've got the jam side there and you have an ammo. Uh, there are various ammo counters that you can also choose to bring with you and find along the way that will um, help you out if you have a weapon jam or you're out of ammunition. In terms of the whoops, uh, rest of the game, the turn sequence is fairly simple. It is, um, you can move around the ship uh, count, or space by space, and you can do an exploration. These are all D6 roles, and they refer you to the paragraphs in the book. You may come across somebody to interact with them, and that could be combat interaction, or it could be some other type of interaction. If it is combat, excuse me, if it is combat interaction, you can see the combat sequence that we'll talk about in a minute that you go through. And then finally, there's the reorganization phase, which allows you to, among other things, um, switch weapons. This kind of got a little bit messed up. The only active weapon that you can use in combat is the one that is in your hand. So um, during the re reorganization phase, you can move weapons around your, yourself. So you can be carrying something even in a leg sheath, but um, you can also be carrying on your body and in your hand. And basically, it's going to take you one turn to move something from your body to your hand and two turns to get it from your leg sheath to your body to your hand. That's the way that works. So there's a little bit of maintenance there in terms of moving things around and getting prepared for combat. And it does force some choices. So for example, if you decide to pick a lock, uh, if you've encountered a door that's locked and you have your lockpick in your hand, you and then you do some exploration, you can in effect be walking into an unknown area with some nasty guys there only holding a lockpick and that can have an effect uh, on you on combat. Now the combat itself is, um, I think it's a little bit fiddly, I don't know if fiddly is the right word, it's a little counterintuitive. I appreciate what they were trying to do, but I've always found it a little difficult to deal with. You have this first person perspective here for your character, and around the character you can see here, there are various orientations, the behind the character, in front of the character, to the, well that's not helping, to the right and to the left of the character, and then you also have the positions, far away, uh, middle distance, and nearby. And nearby means that you're in the same space effectively and need to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. What happens at the uh, beginning of a combat phase is that the orientation, you can choose to change your orientation. When the bad guys come in, the paragraphs will direct you where to place them and at what orientation. So it may say, you know, far away facing you or far away not facing you. Um, and you need to turn if you want to engage in combat. But it's, it's reverse in a sense because really, um, the picture is to you. The picture of the character is to you, I guess, for aesthetic purposes. Um, but when you're turning, you have to imagine it as if you're the first person. So you, I always have difficulty with left and right anyway. So that becomes a little challenging for me to reorient um, and uh, understand why why it's done. But that's the one part of the game rules that kind of stop me up. The rest is fairly simple in terms of the combat. We looked at the that what the CRTs are in effect, you are deciding what your weapon is. Um, whoever has, as I mentioned, the higher alertness value um, and the all these 
characters have an alertness value on them. Whoever has the higher alertness value will go first in combat and then it will sort of go back and forth. If you take a wound you are indicated where the wound could be. So totally unwounded is here and you can be wounded there and you can also heal yourself if you have the first aid kit or if you come across a first aid kit. Because of course the bulk of this game really and the reason why ultimately I'm not going to show you any gameplay whatsoever is the exploration of the space station and reading the paragraphs that describe what you're encountering and then making decisions about what to do. Because it is narrative that is generated through these paragraphs, to some extent the decision making that you have is relatively limited. It sort of follows a choose your own adventure type of model where you can, for example, choose to take something that you see lying around or not take it. And then sometimes if you take it, you're directed to a different paragraph and something good or bad may happen as a result you can say that um, that makes it very prescribed in terms of what happens. Uh, but the way this paragraph system works is quite clever and I actually think it gives a little more replay and variability than some of the other games that um, use a paragraph based system, most notably say Ambush, which I treated in a different video. Although like with Ambush, I'm not really showing any gameplay here. Um, the reason that the paragraph system is a little more variable is that it is based, it is sort of terrain based. So I mentioned here that um, the map has different types of terrain. So, you know, if you're in a blue square, you're in a service area. What will happen is, and I guess I will show you. Um, I will just show you something from here. If you don't want to see it, look away. Um, but I will show you how it works pretty effectively to give some replay, a little bit more replay value to the game than you might expect. So let's say I'm in a service area and I roll a 16 and I'm directed therefore to paragraph 16. The only thing I read here is this description under service. So in that case, I would have entered the crew lounge. It contains a number of comfortable chairs, a bar, and a coffee dispenser. It also contains one bartender. And as I mentioned, this is how they explain where he is, right far inward, and one garçon, left middle inward, who attack. So this would uh, automatically direct combat to occur. In some other cases, it may say something like, there are people there and you can decide to you know, talk to them or fight with them or just leave. But the point is that because each paragraph has so many different uses depending on where you are there's actually there's certainly more than one or two or three gameplays in this game without coming across the same thing in the same area because you would need to continue to roll the same value in the exact same hex or or square um, repeatedly to have the same experience and you can see that mathematically that's not likely of course it is possible but it is not likely and therefore you do get some more variability these paragraphs are also used for things, if you look down here where it says door, you're rolling as you're moving through um, these doors, these open areas here, you are meant to be rolling to see if the door is locked or if you can pass through it. And um, it's the same thing, whatever number you get, you're just checking the door area in that paragraph. So the fact that they are multi-use in that way for at least these, this portion of the, um, the paragraphs gives more variability than you might expect. Later on here, which I'm not really going to show you, it will um, show you or explain effects that happen um, to carry out the rest of the story. And here we come to the um, AI sort of maintenance chart decision trees for combat. And as I mentioned, there are two types of people or beings they're called that you would encounter. They are, there are robots and then there are other characters or you might think of them as NPCs. And it's a pretty basic 
decision tree that you follow to determine how they act in combat, whether uh, you need to conduct hand-to-hand, -hand, whether you need to conduct other type of combat, whether they are moving and changing equipment. And um, the overall charts are relatively simple as uh, the game itself and the game mechanics are as well. I think that subconsciously the reason why I decided to pick up this game out of my closet and play it again and do the video right now is because I was reading, I've been reading uh, this book, this Infocom book, the Zor Chronicles and a couple of others of them and it reminded me, I think, I didn't realize this until I started doing the video and sort of needed to move my book to get to something. I think just this put it in my head, this game, because this game, like others that are paragraph-based, really are an attempt almost to have the experience of interactive fiction through cardboard, through an actual game mechanic, and not the computer interface of interactive fiction or just the actual book interface of interactive fiction. Now this is a novel uh, based on the Zork characters but it's not actually like a choose your own adventure but that is what this is attempting to do. It is trying to give you the feeling of something that is unfolding um, and it is using the paragraph system to do that. It is um, creating the story with a story and more so than certain type of game mechanics because the mechanics here are very simple and um, the interactivity you have with the game really comes through the use of the paragraphs in the story and moving through this, um, you know, relatively generic, at least, um, design of a space station and it is what you're reading in here that is helping you create the tension and the development of the story. And I think for the most part it works. I mean the um, interactivity becomes more of a psychological interactivity, you know, as if you're getting involved in something that is a story, that is a narrative, more so than the details of a complicated game mechanic. So that I think is very effective. From a design standpoint, I think the challenge is in having a degree of complexity in the game and in the game choices as but not, you know, not having to have like a whole war and peace kind of paragraph system. And I think for the most part this does achieve it because it kind of has the maximum of complexity and detail with a very efficient use of these paragraphs. Now do you get as much choice in here, as much decision making, as much kind of hand wringing as you do in other games? No, uh, certainly not other games that I prefer or other games that I've treated on this channel, but it is kind of, it's not surprising. I mean, it's inherent to this type of system where that would be impossible to do. But you do get an experience and a feeling of a story of something unfolding, even if the surprises are maybe not... Um, as varied as one might want. I mean, in essence, you know, you know who you're encountering and when you have, um, even in the rules here, when you have a certain cast of characters, um, you know that those are the people that you're going to be encountering and they're even kind of defined for you as to who they are. Certainly you're looking for villains and the choices that you have are are a num there are a number of choices as to who that villain could be, but it's not like there are sort of hidden problems or sub-quests that arise during the course of the game. I think by the nature of this game, um, it's directed gameplay and um, you need to follow a path more or less to make the game work you know, again, without having a rule book that's just impenetrable and um, overly detailed and overly fiddly. So um, I think in that regard, this game does do that, even if the challenges are not um, so varied uh, and the obstacles themselves are somewhat similar. But it is meant to be, a, you know, a heroic and dramatic story, a sort of campy story of this guy 
coming in and saving the day. And um, I recommend if you do get this game, and it comes with a magazine to read the story. It certainly is far from great literature, but it really does set the stage for what you're trying to do. And it's part and parcel of playing this type of game. And um, again, to talk about it in this way without showing the gameplay is the choice that I'm making because I do think there is a limit to the surprise value, even if the way the system is set up, you can go through the map many times without encountering the same thing in the same place. There is a certain surprise value that I don't want to ruin. There um, is a series of videos up that show more of the actual gameplay, and I think it's actually a playthrough of a game. You could watch that if you wanted to see more, but for what I was presenting here, I just kind of wanted it to be really as spoiler-free as possible and uh, just a discussion and little bit of a demonstration or, or showing you what comes in this kind of unique unique Ares game. Um, one of many that were story-based and published with the magazine and the likes of which I really doubt we will see published again. Thanks for watching.